Pardon? Okay, so before I start the lecture, just two quick things. First one, I gave you an exercise, but I wrote the wrong coefficient. <laughs> it was one quarter and not one half here. So sorry. <laughs> Good way to start, to give an exercise that is impossible to solve. Uh, and then I want to briefly come back again to the question that was uh, asked before, since it came back again, and I insist a lot on the, the formalism versus physics. No? So uh, it's, uh, the, the, the spirit of these lectures is to focus really, to try and focus on the physics of supergravity. And so while it is not important uh, the fact that we do not have a formalism, a superspace formalism to write down supergravity theories with uh, 32 supercharges, for instance. Uh, it is indeed a physical question, the fact that we are able to do, uh, to write down supergravity uh, theories with auxiliary fields or not, so off-shell or not. So to have an off-shell formulation, this is an important physical question, and this is independent of the formalism, again. The fact that I can write any supergravity theories in a specific formalism, I mean, that's a matter of taste, how much important you, 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 you think that question is, but definitely doesn't change the physics content. No? The way you formulate a theory might make more manifest certain properties, so it might be important, it might be interesting. Superspace, of course, makes clear invariance under supersymmetry, but uh, it's not necessary. Okay, so again, try to focus on the physics uh, questions first. Okay, so uh, this morning we uh, saw that in order to make supersymmetry local, we need to do a theory of supergravity. We need gravity. So uh, we have to start essentially from the einstein hilbert action the rarita schwinger action, of course, because we want supersymmetry, so we want the Gravitino as well. And then we have to guess what are the supersymmetry transformations and see whether we can make, possibly add additional terms in order to make the action supersymmetric invariant. Uh, which is something that we're going to do later. But in order to do that, and in order to uh, understand more in general how to guess sometimes uh, the supersymmetric transformations, no? because if I just give you an action, no? I have the graviton and the gravitino, and I let you, and I ask you, okay, make the action supersymmetric, you wouldn't know where to start in order to write down a supersymmetric action no? to, to decide what are the supersymmetric transformations. Of course, you want that the gravitino transforms in the graviton, the graviton should transform in the gravitino, but how do you write down the supersymmetric transformations? There is an infinite, an infinite uh, number of different possibilities. And if you start adding matter content, it's going to be even more complicated. So I will uh, try and show you that uh, there is some way at least to guess partly this, uh, this, uh, this supersymmetry transformations. Uh, if you formulate gravity as, as I write there, sort of a gauge theory using essentially Cartan's formalism. So formalism that I will use a lot, which is uh, to use differential forms, to use field binds rather than the metric, okay? So I'd like to review this formalism a bit uh, in order also to give, uh, to give uh, some context and uh, to arrive at the uh, formulation then of the supersymmetric transformation in a natural way somehow. So you know that in GR, uh, you have as one of the principles on which GR is built, local Lorentz invariance. You know that uh, whatever is space-time, space-time is going to be some manifold, and you know that at any point uh, close to, I mean, at any point on your manifold, you should be able to associate the tangent space and uh, you also know that essentially whatever is the metric 
that you have. So if your line element is written in terms of the metric in this fashion, all that you should be able to put the metric at any arbitrary point on the manifold in the form of Minkowski. And then you know that with the tangent space, you can describe physics close to that. And this can be done explicitly by introducing field binds. which are essentially one forms. These are the bases actually of the cotangent space. But anyway, uh, the important thing is that field have an index mu that transforms under diffeomorphisms and have an index A that transforms under local Lorentz transformations. The fact that essentially at any point you can fix a frame, of course, but you can also introduce different frames which are transformed with respect to the original one by a matrix lambda which can depend on space-time as well now. This is different, of course, than special relativity. Uh, and your line element is not going to change because you will have eta AB, you will have your matrix lambda, another matrix lambda, which this depends on x now. This also depends on x. And then you will have E, C, mu, well, let me write it as, as one forms, ED. And since this is, if lambda is a Lorentz transformation, a local Lorentz transformation, then this is the same as the Minkowski metric. No, this is the fact that uh, you can choose, essentially, a frame of reference at every point on your space-time manifold, and you can choose it as you please, and you can change it, of course, uh, to an observer which instead of being static at that point is moving with a certain velocity, rotated, whatever you want. Okay? And you can do it in a different way at every point on the manifold. So this is just local Lorentz invariance. It's one of the uh, basic requirements you know, to have, uh, to have uh, Einsteinian gravity. So uh, why this is important for us? For us, this is fund not just important, it's fundamental because we said we want to do supergravity, and this means that we want not just gravity, but we want also the gravitino. We want a spinner. Now, the gravitino is a fermion, which is in a definite representation of the Lorentz group, whereas you know that the general linear group doesn't have spinner representations. So in order to couple gravity pinos you need to introduce field binds because you need to go in a, in a particular reference frame essentially where you have your Minkowski metric where your spinors are to be well defined and then you can couple them to gravity by means of the field binds. Otherwise, I mean, GL4, as I said, doesn't have any spinor representations. The Lorentz group does. So, of course, once you do that and you introduce field binds, you can take, for instance, uh, your vectors, I don't know, W mu or V mu, let's say, and uh, if you have a certain vector field, V mu, you can construct a vector field with an index which now is flat. You see, th this was an object that would transform under diffeomorphisms, 
This is an object that doesn't transform under diffeomorphisms. This depends only on an index A, which transforms under local Lorentz transformation, but does not transform under diffeomorphisms. Why? Because essentially you have opposite transformation on the vector field and the field bind, such a way that the whole thing is invariant. And of course, you can have covectors. Well, these are really the components of the vectors and the components of the covectors, but it's the same thing. You're essentially finding, uh, writing down a basis. And the components <coughs> can be multiplied again with, uh, instead of the field bind, if you wish, the inverse field bind here and construct, well, let, let me call this W, a WA with index down. No? When I introduce the E with an index mu up, and an index A down in such a way that if I take the sum in, if I contract either of the two indices, I get a delta. Okay, so one is the inverse of the other. Okay, I use the same symbol as is customary, uh, but it's clear which is which. Okay, from the position of the indices, clearly. <clears throat> and you can also see, of course, that you can raise and lower indices. Uh, the mu nu indices, the curved indices, are raised and lower with the metric. The, the flat indices, A, B, C, D, are going to be raised and lower with the flat metric. Eta. Now, uh, just like you do when... Uh, you consider uh, vectors, covectors, tensors in general and general relativity, uh, you can see that uh, if you take, uh, so if I have a vector and this transforms with the Lorentz transformation in this way, which is a local Lorentz transformation, I insist, so all these quantities are space-time dependent, uh, and this can happen, for instance, because, again, I have my manifold, I have two patches, I have my point in here, I have decided to use two different frames related to the two patches. When I move from one patch to the other, I have to use a local Lorentz transformation, so I change the way I represent my vector field. Uh, when I do that, I have a problem with the derivatives, just like when you the general relativity, no? And you started introducing tensors, you knew that uh, uh, V mu, if V mu is a vector, which means that it transforms with uh, uh, the Jacobian of the coordinate change, uh, when you change coordinates, the derivative, the simple derivative of V mu does not transform covariantly, does not transform again with the Jacobian. Here it's the same thing. So now let me use differentials rather than, the, than derivatives, but it's the same thing also because I will use then the language of differential forms. Uh, you see that if I take a derivative of this object, uh, this means that I'm taking a derivative of lambda times v, which contains, of course, the transformation of the derivative of v, but it contains also a term where you have the derivative of the transformation. Okay, so how do I uh, construct derivatives which are covariant under local Lorentz transformations? I have to introduce covariant derivatives. So rather than taking a simple exterior differential, I introduce the exterior differential plus a connection, okay, which is going to be called the spin connection, precisely because, as I said, this is what allows me to introduce spinos eventually, okay? So, uh, how do I do that? Well, I do it in such a way that, for instance, when I take a derivative of, a covariant derivative of a vector, this is going to be, this is the definition essentially, I have the simple derivative plus my connection contracted with V. Okay, so it has to have two indices if this is a vector. No, I will have to, uh, and I can do similarly for covectors. Again, taking care of raising and lowering indices in the appropriate way with the Minkowski metric. And 
uh, this now tells me how to uh, make things uh, work uh, correctly because you see that if I assume that the transformation of my uh, spin connection, no? so what I said is uh, essentially, uh, yeah, okay, V prime is, uh, um, yeah, okay, let me write it like this. So I, I would like to have the dVA prime is lambda AB dVB, okay? So from this now you can understand the transformation rule for the connection because this is defined as dVA prime plus lambda, uh, plus omega, sorry, AB VB prime, and you want this to be lambda AB dVB plus lambda AB omega BC BC. So you see, uh, VA prime, as we said, is lambda V, so I have the derivative of this, plus I have this, plus I will have here uh, lambda BC, BC, okay? And if you want to make things uh, to, well, sorry, actually, this is also transformed, so omega also should be the transformed one here. Uh, so if I want this thing to be the same, I need omega to transform as well. And you see that omega transforms as a connection, meaning that uh, this must transform with uh, a term that goes with the derivative of the transformation, of course. Uh, but then you need also, uh, so this is going to be, well, if I write it like that, is a minus d lambda times lambda plus I have a piece which is homogeneous. I hope I got the signs right, but anyway, I, I will have, sorry, I will have one piece that transforms uh, covariantly, of course, as, as any tensor, but you have also an, inhom an inhomogeneous piece, which is characteristic of any connection, no? So whenever you have a connection, this is going to transform usually, no, with U, A, U dagger, but you will also have a term which is of the form uh, U, D, U dagger, no, or something like that. I'm being schematic here. This is what makes the difference between the connection and the, and the, and the curvatures. And this is the same here. So the, the spin connection should transform as a connection indeed uh, in order to make things, uh, in order to make things covariant. Now, uh, just like when you introduce the Levi-Civita connection, no? when you introduce the Levi-Civita connection, uh, what do you say, what do you do? You actually can introduce a connection in general relativity. You can introduce several different connections in principle on a manifold, which are compatible with uh, the change of coordinates that you have. However, you uh, uh, make some requirements on the connection. You ask that the connection is compatible with the metric, and you want the connection to be torsionless in order to have a Riemannian manifold, okay? So here is the same thing. So now that I have introduced a spin connection, I can ask the same two things, which is I can ask compatibility with the metric, of course, in this case, the flat metric, and I can ask that the connection be torsionless. So compatibility with the metric means essentially that when I take the covariant derivative of this object, uh, well, this should be zero, okay? And this is pretty straightforward in this case because you have the simple derivative, but this is constant, so you can forget about that. 
And then uh, you have essentially the, the connection pieces. And you see, I have two terms here. Uh, one, the connection once the connection acts on the first index, and once the connection acts on the second index. And uh, when you have something like omega a c eta c b, for instance, since this is the metric that raises and lowers indices, this is the same as writing down the connection here with both indices down. And as I said, I have two, two, two pieces, you know, when I act on the first and on the second, and essentially what I have here is that the symmetric part of the spin connection should vanish. Okay, if you do the uh, exercise uh, pedantically, you have two terms, one acting on the first index, one acting on the second index, using the symmetry, of course, of eta, and the fact that here you had one upper and one lower index, eventually what you get is that the symmetric part of the connection once you lower both indices or you raise both of them, it's the same thing, it doesn't matter, is vanishing, okay? So this means that the connection must be anti-symmetric uh, with respect to the Lorentz indices once you have both of them lowered or both of them raised. Of course, when they are one up and one down, there is no symmetry. I mean, well, you can exchange them, but... Torsionless, so first of all, you have to introduce the torsion tensor. So the torsion tensor is introduced as the covariant derivative of the field bind. And this means the differential of the field bind plus, again, the spin connection. And now here, this is a one form, so I have a wedge product there, okay? Because the, the spin connection is also a one form. And so I have something like that, and being torsionless means that this has to vanish. What is this telling you now? No? In the, in the, if you remember in the, uh, for the levitch vita connection, no, the compatibility with the metric uh, and the torsionlessness give you two conditions. The, the, the compatibility with the metric tells you that the gamma can be written as a function of G and its derivatives. And the torsionlessness tells you that gamma is symmetric in the lower indices, essentially. Now here, you have the same, uh, the same two requirements, but essentially the results are the opposite. This is telling you that the connection is anti-symmetric, the, the compatibility with the metric, whereas the torsionlessness now tells you that the spin connection is not independent from the metric, is not independent from the field bind, because from this equation, you can, in principle, solve for omega as a function, of course, of the field bind and its derivatives. Okay? Now, uh, this, of course, tells you that you don't have additional degrees of freedom. Now, the degrees of freedom are all contained in the field bind, the metric. You don't want additional degrees of freedom, clearly. The bind. Uh, the other thing that you might ask is, this is okay, but is this the same as the formulation that I have with the metric and the levi civita connection or not? And the answer is that it is if you require that the field bind be fully... Sorry. Invariant, once you introduce the both the spin connection. So if I now take the formulation with all the components here, so there I just use the differentials, differential forms. If I use the uh, components, then uh, the field bind also has an index that transforms under the diffeomorphism, and therefore I have to also introduce here uh, the uh, levi civita connection. And this is the compatibility of the two formulations. So if the 
this equation is true, you see right away that you can give gamma as a function of omega or omega as a function of gamma. In fact, you can take this, again, it's a nice exercise and not very difficult. Uh, the difficult part is to find the solution for omega in here. Here you have to use a trick. But once you have the, diff the, the solution for omega as a function of the field band, you can plug it in here, and then you see from, from this is very easy to extract the levi civita connection because you just multiply with the inverse field bind so that you remove this, this is invertible. And then you find uh, the formula for gamma and you can check that the formula for gamma is the standard levi civita connection. Vice versa, you can take the levi civita connection, you can plug it in here, and again, you can solve it for omega and find the expression for the spin connection which you obtain from solving the torsion constraint, okay? So this is just to say that uh, you can formulate, of course, uh, general relativity using uh, field binds and f differential forms rather than uh, the levi civita connection, and this is something that will be useful also later. Now, one thing that is interesting here is the following, of course. As usual, when I have a covariant derivative, Let's say I have a covariant derivative, as I said before, which acts on a vector. I can take the square, so I can act with another covariant derivative. And since these are differential forms, this is like a commutator of derivatives, and the commutator of covariant derivatives should give me the curvature. And in fact, if I do that, you see, I have the covariant derivative acting on this object. So then I should have the covariant derivative acting on that. Remember, the differential square is zero, no? The simple differential square is zero. So I don't have the differential acting on this. The differential will act only on the other two terms. So I have B omega AB VB plus, well, actually minus, because I have to be careful, these are differential forms, so when I move the derivative, no, you know that one forms anti-commute, so if I move the derivative over, I get a minus sign, and then I have uh, omega A um, C D V C plus omega A C, omega C B, and of course there are wedges here everywhere which I didn't write, V B. And so you see this term and that term are the same and go away, and you can rewrite these two terms together as the curvature R A B on V B, where R A B is defined it's a two-form, it's a differential two-form, A, B defined in this way, okay? Now, this is a differential two-form, which means that you can expand it further uh, in a basis of field binds, for instance. Or you can go in components and rewrite it in this fashion. And the interesting thing is that this object here, as you would expect, should be, uh, well, either depends how you want to consider it, either related or it is exactly the Riemann tensor in the sense that you can prove, once again, the equality of this object with the Riemann tensor constructed in the usual way with field. 
Okay, this is standard Riemann. the relation, okay? So it's just a different way of rewriting the same things. But it's interesting. Why is it interesting now? Now, this is interesting because I can now give you a way to interpret the equation of general relativity and more in general supergravity and the transformation rules of uh, the field bind, the spin connection, the curvature, so on and so forth, in GR and now and, and later in supergravity, by making a parallel between what we are doing here and what you would do in a generic gauge theory. Okay? So first of all, I hope that this was more or less something that you have already seen. Okay, so it was just a refresher, hopefully. In any case, it's not too complicated, but These are things that more or less you find in any, well, most standard textbooks of general relativity. Now, the interesting thing is the parallel with gauge theories. What do you do when you have a gauge theory? You start from a Lie algebra. I mean, I'm not now doing fancy things. I'm thinking about a very simple gauge theory based on a Lie algebra, and you have the generators of your Lie algebra. Now, these generators of the Lie algebra satisfy certain commutation relations, where these are structure constants, of course. Okay. Now, when you want to construct a gauge T, you introduce essentially a connection, a one form. I mean, essentially, you have a vector field or a one form there. Let's do it with vector fields, and you introduce as many as the generators of your group as the elements of the algebra of your group that you want to gauge. And the transformation rule satisfied by your connection in order to construct gauge theory are such that your connection transforms inhomogeneously, of course, with the derivative of the gauge parameter but then, this is a non-abelian theory, and you have non-trivial structure constants, then you also have the structure constants here, and again, the connection and the parameter. No? So, you decide what your gauge group is, you take the algebra of that group, you introduce a number of uh, vector fields, which is the same as the dimension of your algebra, and you ask that your connection transforms in this fashion. Then, this transforms in a way that is not covariant, because, of course, you need this transformation with the derivative, as we discussed this morning, in order to uh, go from global to local symmetry. But then, you introduce also the curvature, Precisely because while the connection does not transform covariantly, the curvature does. And how do you introduce the curvature? You construct the curvature by, again, taking the derivative of your connection, but not just the simple derivative, because you have now a non-trivial theory with uh, some trivial structure constants, and therefore you also introduce a piece that depends on the structure constants here, and which is quadratic 
in the connection. Now, if you play the game of taking this transformation and applying it to the curvature, what you learn is that this indeed transforms only with the structure constants times the curvature times the parameter. There are no derivatives left anymore, so this transforms covariantly. Okay? Then, of course, if this is a gauge theory, you also want to write down an action, and then the action is written in terms of the square of these curvatures, no? the sum of the square of these curvatures. And this is where the analogy will break, of course, because we know that in GR, the action has only the Riemann curvature once, not twice. Okay? You can consider theories where you, have, where you start with R square, but this is a different story. Anyway, what is interesting here is that if you take this parallel now and in to, for gravity and you say, okay, let me just, just do bosonic case now. Let's take the Poincaré group In the Poincaré group, I have translation generators and I have Lorentz rotations. Now, oh, yeah, the coefficients in order to be consistent. Let's hope. Okay. So clearly, this is anti symmetric in CD and it's anti symmetric in BC, in BA, sorry. So it's like that. This is the Poincare algebra. So now what you can see is, okay, I have the Poincaré algebra, and let's see how much we can push the analogy. I can say, well, I have a set of connections, and I want one connection per generator. So I need a vector field, which has an index mu, and an index A associated to each generator of the transitions. And then I have to have a generator, which I call omega, with indices A, B associated to the generators M, B. Now, in order not to overcount this, I will put a factor of one half, because clearly if I'm summing both on A and B, you know, I will have one, two, one, two, but then I will have two, one, two, one, and so on and so forth. No? So let me put a factor of one half. And you see, vector fields that I have here I already wrote <laughs> essentially their names, uh, look like uh, a field bind endospin connection in the sense that they have the same structure. This is clearly anti-symmetric in AB, just like the tensor, uh, the, just like the generator of Lorentz transformations. And this has uh, the right uh, the index structure to be a field bind, but is it just the index structure? No, there's more, because now you can do exactly what wrote there. You can take from the algebra, this is my algebra, I can take the structure constants. So clearly, when the indices capital A and capital B there are both small, I get a zero. When I have the commutator of a double index with a single index, instead I get something. But I get something which clearly has the generator P, which means that C should also be single index. Okay, so I have that translation and translation commute, so zero. Moment, um, sorry, uh, Lorentz rotations and translations give me a translation, not a Lorentz transformation. And Lorentz with Lorentz gives me Lorentz, no piece here. So I can extract the structure constants from this. And if I look at the structure constants, then I can also understand what is the transformation rule. I can write down the transformation rule for the field bind, and I can write down the transformation rule for the spin connection. Just looking at the structure constants. So, of course, 
here I have a number of generators, so I have a number of different symmetries. Now I will have the transformations which are related to the translations and those which are related to the Lorentz rotations. Clearly, the EA, which is the one associated to translations, will, will have an inhomogeneous part with respect to translations, whereas this will have the inhomogeneous part with respect to the Lorentz rotations. And what you get is that uh, the transformation under Lorentz rotations of omega is the one that I wrote before, for instance. And if you look at the Lorentz transformation of E, for instance, okay, let's look at the Lorentz transformation here, lambda. So if I look at the Lorentz transformation, this means I want a parameter in the transformation which has a double index, okay? My index A has, there is a single index which is the translation and the double index which is the Lorentz rotation. Now if I look at this transformation here, you clearly see that uh, the, the, the derivative only will come with a single index, so it's not there. And then I have the structure constants in which this index should be an index that goes on the momenta. The parameter epsilon, which is the Lorentz transformation, which I call lambda, should be a double index. So here I should have a structure constant with a B that I don't know yet, a double index, let me call it uh, BC, and a single index here. And then I will need here to decide what is the vector field that I have to take and epsilon, and lambda, sorry, bc, okay? So is there a structure constant here of that type? Yes, there is, because I know, I see here that I have a structure constant. If I look at this commutator, this has, this is essentially, this has the form of a structure constant in which I have a double index, a single index, and another single index contracted with the generator PD. Okay, what is the structure constant here? It's a bunch of etas and deltas, no? If I write this down, this is going to be some eta uh, B C delta D A anti-symmetrized, and there will be some coefficient now. Let me not derive the coefficient, you can do that. It's very simple, okay? So this means that if you plug it in here, you see, I need here, I get the translation, which means I get the field bind again. And this is going to be what? The structure constants is going to be what I wrote there. So this is going to be some delta and some eta with, of course, sorry, with, of course, some coefficient. But you see now, let me forget about the coefficient for a second. Look at the structure. And the structure gives you what? It gives you lambda. Now, one index becomes D. Another index becomes A. Uh, and then you have E mu D, which is exactly as you would expect the field bind to transform under Lorentz transformations, okay? So this is to say that if you take the Poincaré algebra and you extract the structure constants, clearly here you have, for instance, structure constants which have indices AB, CD, EF times MEF, and so on and so forth, and you plug them in the expression that I wrote here, you obtain exactly the transformation rules of the field by and on the spin connection under Lorentz transformations, for instance, or under translations. The other interesting thing is the following. If you look at the same structure constants that you derive from there, you can build the curvatures. The curvatures are going to be the derivative of the vectors plus the structure constants times the vectors squared. And what are the, the, the curvatures that you get? Well, that's the interesting part. You get precisely the torsion, which is the derivative of the field bind, plus a term in which you have two vectors, which are the field bind and the spin connection. And the other curvature is precisely the curvature two form, 
which contains only the spin connection. So let's see this one first. Now, this is clear. Uh, where do I have the Lorentz generators on the right hand side? Only the commutator of two M's, of two Lorentz generators. So this means that the only way, the only time I get here, uh, I get omega omega when I have here something that has the indices again of an omega. So it's, I get the, the derivative plus omega omega. Here instead, I get that the, the, the sorry, the translation generator, the, the, the translation generator is associated to the field bind. So when I write DE, I should have on the other side the structure constant that contains one E and one omega, which is exactly what I have here. Okay? So this is to say that if I look at the algebra, from the algebra I can guess what should be the structure of the curvatures and the transformation rules of the objects which I have here. And why interesting? Because now I can take, rather than Poincaré, I can take super Poincaré. I can take the algebra of supersymmetry. So the super Poincaré algebra, of course, contains this, but it contains more, no? It contains the, uh, now again, let me not be specific with the coefficient, but you get the commutator of Q, Q bar, which goes into P slash, and then you know that the commutator of M with Q gives you the representation, which again goes with the gammas on Q. And you know that instead, uh, sorry, this is the commutator. And P with Q instead commutes, no? These are the uh, commutator, the additional commutators and anti-commutators that you have in the super Poincaré algebra with some coefficient. Now, let me not enter into the details of the coefficient because what interests me is really the structure. So if you do the super Poincaré, this means that now you will have to add here some other vectors, which however must be vector spinors associated to the supercharges. And if you have n supercharges, you will have to introduce n gravitinos. Okay, but let's do n equals one, so we'll have one gravitino. And this means now that this definition of the curvatures is going to change, as well as I will have a curvature for the gravitino itself. And the interesting piece here is clearly the torsion. Why? Because we said before, the analogy between this gauge theory and gravity ends up at this level because and in order to really do gravity and not a gauge theory, I have to impose the torsion constraint because I don't want this and that to be independent degrees of freedom. I want the spin connection to be a function of the metric, to be a function of the field bias. So at some point I have to introduce a torsion constraint that tells me that omega is a function of E. But now, look what happens when you do supergravity, when you do super Poincaré. In super Poincaré, you have additional commutators. And among the additional commutators, there is another commutator that closes on the translations here, which is the commutator of two Qs. So this means that among the structure constants that I have here, that close on the translation, so that close on the, that give me the curvature of the field bind, there isn't just a commutator of a Lorentz transformation and a translation, and therefore I have an omega and an E, but I have also Q, Q bar. And this closes on the translation, of course, with a gamma. Here there is a gamma, no? There is a gamma mu, gamma A, P, A. So this means that the structure constant should contain the gamma matrix. And this means that this gets improved with some coefficient that depends on how you define the algebra, but it has to be improved with a bilinear of the gravitino. Here I'm, I'm writing down again everything as one forms, so this means 
the following thing, okay? Assume that you have differential forms everywhere here. So, so here there is also a wedge. But if you prefer, we can write it in points. This means that t mu nu a is two times the derivative of nu plus omega a b e nu b, and then you get psi mu gamma a psi nu, okay? And the fact now that you say that this is zero, if you still require this to be zero, this will tell you now that the spin connection is not just a function of the field binds, but it will be a function of field binds and the gravitinos. So that's why you often hear that supergravity is not a standard gravity theory, but it's a theory with torsion. Because now the interpretation will be that with respect to the standard covariant derivative, the standard covariant derivative is not vanishing. The standard covariant derivative of the field bind, DEA, sorry, this was DEA, before it was just DEA. Now, this is DEA, the covariant derivative. Now, if you set the whole thing to zero, the covariant derivative of the field bind is not zero because you now have the gravitino bilinear appearing. Okay? Now, of course, when you, as soon as you introduce the torsion constraint, then the you had obtained from this expression for what concerns translations will not make sense anymore. Because, of course, this object is not invariant under translations. Okay, so the fact that you impose this constraint breaks the original translation invariance that you had, and indeed the theory, uh, final theory is uh, uh, you don't have Poincaré invariance in general relativity. You have diffeomorphism invariance and you have local Lorentz invariance. Okay, but that makes sense. And now here, this is extended to supergravity. And you see, among the various things, you also read from the same structure constants, you also read the transformation of the gravitino, for instance, under supersymmetry. The transformation of the gravitino under supersymmetry must be the covariant derivative of the supersymmetry parameter because this is the inhomogeneous part plus a piece in which you have the spin connection and the structure constants acting on epsilon because you see, if I look at the uh, structure constants which have a gravitino, sorry, which have a supercharge, this comes from the commutator of, sorry, this is, yeah, the supersymmetry parameter, this comes from the commutator of uh, a Lorentz transformation and a supercharge. So if I want to replace uh, every supercharge in here with the supersymmetry parameter, then this tells you exactly how the gravitino should transform. And you can do this for Every field it tells you also how the uh, field binds should, should transform under supersymmetry. And again, you read it then from here, for instance. And again, I'm not very precise with the coefficients, but you see from here that under supersymmetry, this should be an object which goes with a gamma matrix and the gravitino. because I have two Qs, so I should have here the supersymmetry parameter and here another Q, which means another gravi a gravitino. Right. Yeah. The additional term? The structure constants. So if I look at the structure constants of two Qs, what are the structure constants? Now here depends on which is the correct coefficient, but let's say that I have indices, let's say alpha, alpha dot, okay? If you want to write it in two components level, this is like a gamma mu, alpha, alpha dot, times p mu, or a, actually, because we use the flat indices like that. 
So what are the structure constants? The structure constants are just the gamma matrix. Okay? So this means now that you have among the various structure constants that you have uh, from the algebra there, I have that a structure constant that has one spinor index, another spinor index of the opposite chirality, of course, and a vector, this is just gamma. Maybe efficient, but I mean, of the algebra, okay? So if I have this structure constant, now when I write down the curvature, the torsion means that I replace this index with a simple index A. And then you see, among the various structure constants, I have here something which has an index alpha and an index alpha bar. So what is the vector mu alpha and what is the vector nu alpha bar? This is just the gravitino and the conjugate of the gravitino. Okay? It doesn't need to be linear in the field line because the thing is, you see, this is the formula. So essentially here you have, you have that the terms which are linear in the connection is only the derivative of the connection and this is the first piece. And then you have the quadratic pieces in the connections. Now the quadratic pieces in the connection can be any two connections. You, the, your connection contains several different pieces, no? And generically, when you do a gauge theory, you don't distinguish, you don't call uh, the, first, uh, the first indices PA, then the rest M, A, B, on, no? You just call everything A, A, A mu A, no? The connection is just what it is because your gauge group, I mean, you don't start giving different names to different pieces here, no? Of, of your generators. That's the difference. But you shouldn't be confused by that. This is just giving names to the various pieces in your algebra. The fact is that you're used to call the different generators in a different way because they have different properties uh, and, and, and it's useful to do so. But once you have a certain set of generators, and in this case, you see, your generators contain... So this is just... This is what I wrote before as A mu A T A. Simply, I, I split my TA into PA, MAB, and Q. And therefore, I have to split my connections into E mu A, omega mu, and psi mu. And now the generic structure will be that the uh, transformation of the connection is going to be the derivative plus something with that has one connection and one parameter. And the curvatures are going to be the derivative plus something which has two connections. But the two connections can be anything, depending on the structure constants. The point is that if I look at the structure constants of the supersymmetry algebra, I see that I have here something that closes on the momenta, which is the anti-commutator of two supersymmetries. So this means that I have a structure constant, as I wrote here, which is a gamma, which interpolates between the vector index and the two spinor indices, and therefore this tells me that I can write down the curvature, why did I write it here? In the curvature, I have to add this term here in the definition of this curvature, the curvature of the field line, of course. I can do the same thing for the curvature of the, connect, the spin connection. I can introduce the curvature for the gravitino and so on and so forth. The point I wanted to stress here is the fact that since then, this is the curvature which you set to zero, in order to relate the spin connection to the field binds, when you have supergravity, when you have the superalgebra, then the spin connection is not just a function of the field bind, but it contains generically also the gravitinos. And so if you interpret this in terms of standard Riemannian geometry, uh, the manifolds of supergravity are not, strictly speaking, uh, uh, standard Riemannian geometry because the covariant derivative of the field bind is not zero because it contains these bilinears of the gravitinos. Yes, up first. No, no, I know, yeah, okay. Very good point. So. 
uh, as I said, it's an analogy, and as I said, it works to a certain extent. Where does it stop? The fact is that out of all the generators of your original symmetry, of your Poincaré symmetry, you want to keep local Lorentz invariance. You want to keep supersymmetry. So those are going to be preserved, and the transformations that you get for those will still, be remain, uh, will still remain true. What you're going to break are translations, because you impose this condition. You impose that the torsion is vanishing, and this is not invariant under translations. So this symmetry will not be there in the final theory. Then, of course, the fact that the theory is going to be indeed uh, invariant under supersymmetries and invariant under local Lorentz transformation uh, requires you to write down the Lagrangian in an appropriate way that is compatible with the transformations that you derived in this fashion. But the way you find the curvatures and the way you find the symmetries, the transformation rules of Philbein and the Gravitino from the other, this is, this is, this is okay. This is a way, it's, it's the way, you, essentially, if you wish, uh, to define the transformation rules, no? I want this to be the symmetry of my theory, so I start from the algebra, I want my object to transform in a certain fashion that respect these symmetries, then the curvature should be done in a certain way, and that's what I get. Okay? The difference, of course, is that now the curvatures in a young mills theory will start building curvature for each connection, take the square, and this is not what you're going to do now, of course. Okay. The torsion. Yeah, because when you take the 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 the. Yes, sorry. So the question is why. Uh, let's see first if I understood the question. <laughs> so the question is why setting uh, this object, which I call the torsion, to zero implies that effectively the torsion is vanishing, yes. meaning that uh, you don't have, uh, I guess, the question is that you don't have that the uh, commutators of the derivative will have something linear then yeah. in the object that you get. Uh, well, this you can work out explicitly. Uh, let's see. Uh, what would be the, the best answer? Um, you know that... Uh, um, uh, as I said before, no? for instance, when you take the commutator of your derivatives, here on the right-hand side, in fact, you would find, in general, the curvature terms acting on the object, depending on how the object transforms. You might not get anything if this is a scalar, but I mean, it depends, and you might get indeed the torsion here. And uh, again, depending on, on what is the structure of the, of, the, of, the, of the object that you put here. Uh, but I mean, uh, asking that this is vanishing is exactly requiring that this object is not there. So I'm not sure I understand exactly the question. So. Yes, this is precisely what appears if you do the 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 the, uh, the commutator. So if you have something which is non-zero, like in this case, the fact that in the connection you start having these terms, this bilinear in psi, then you start having on the right hand side something when you take this commutator. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, hi, I have a question. Yeah. Um. So, There's always this voice um, coming from, uh, yeah. So I was just start. I just startled for a second. Please. No problem. Um, why do we not consider this gravitino bilinear in the covariant derivatives? Why did we not consider this gravitino bilinear in the covariant derivative? Uh, you mean, why don't I define this object as being the covariant derivative, a new covariant derivative of the field bind? This is what you're asking? Is this the uh, question? Yes. yes. Well, because you have then uh, to have, uh, you have to construct the covariant derivative on every other object, not just on the field bind. No, this is the covariant derivative of the. 
this is the covariant derivative on the field by infusion, then you have to build a covariant derivative on every vector like object. Now this is the, the way, this is the covariant derivative acting on the field band because the field band has an index that transforms under Lorentz transformations in a certain way, and this is the way this object becomes covariant now. Uh, uh, this piece is not needed in order to be covariant with respect to Lorentz transformations. Um, that would be one answer. Uh, another answer is if you like to call this another covariant derivative, uh, that would be fine with me, but I don't know exactly what would the purpose of that be because this is not the object that gives you the, the standard curvature. No? So the point is that see what is the departure from standard general relativity here. So in standard general relativity, I would have that the torsion is defined as this object. So this is the covariant derivative. This is the derivative that is covariant with respect to local Lorentz transformations. This piece is not needed in order to be covariant. It's true that if I add it, it's still covariant because this is a vector. But it doesn't need to be there. And therefore, I define the torsion now as the old if you wish, covariant derivative plus this piece. But uh, this is just because I'm asking this object to be covariant with respect to this transformation. So I don't know if I explain myself, but I mean, when you introduce a covariant derivative, you introduce it because you want the uh, derivative of that particular object to transform covariantly. And in order for the derivative of the field bind to transform covariantly, you need these two pieces, but this is not needed. So I see. there is no need to the reason I'm there is no need to introduce please. to introduce this t this term in order for the derivative to be covariant. Okay. I see. The the reason I was asking is because in the connection you have the gravity you know, as well. So no, that's okay. That happens after you solve for t equals zero. You don't have the connection in, you don't have the gravitino in the connection at the beginning, no? When I'm defining this covariant derivative, I have the field by, I have the connection, I have the gravitino. These are independent fields. Now, the spin connection contains the gravitino once I set the torsion to zero. So I start from a theory in which I have the field by, the spin connection, and the gravitino. Then I construct the torsion. If I set the torsion to zero, then I have that the spin connection depends on the gravitinos. It doesn't. It's an independent field. And actually, I'm going to discuss this in a second. Is this clear okay. now? Yes, yes, thank you. When you when you, when you when you spit out the torsion here, meaning the yes, then yes, then yes. Otherwise, this is zero. That's exactly what we're doing. That's exactly what we're doing. So again, it's a matter of interpretation. It's it's subtle, but it's important. No. So if I want to see the deviation from standard GR, then my covariant derivative, of course, is the standard covariant derivative that I had before, and then this is a term that departs from that. I have this gravitino bilinears everywhere. I mean, my spin connection, yes. I'm, I'm going to discuss in, in, in five minutes' time now. If you give me a second, I'm going to move to that now. Yeah, okay. So, uh, so the, 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 the idea here was just to let you know that this is not necessary, okay? This is not necessary to construct a supergravity action. 
but it's a good way to have a feeling of what I should write down as transformation rules for my fields in a supergravity theory. Because if I want to write down, as I said before, a supergravity action, I need the matter content, of course. I have to start maybe from the kinetic terms. Those, for sure, I need to have in order to have the fields that propagate. But then I have to find a way to relate these things with supersymmetry transformation. And the question is, how do I guess these supersymmetry transformations? So this is the way I can guess the supersymmetry transformations. If I look at the algebra, just like in a gauge theory, I know that the algebra fixes the transformation rules of the fields. For supersymmetry, again, the algebra fixes the supersymmetry transformation rules of the fields. That's the idea I wanted to, to give you with this part. Okay? I understand that it's a bit cumbersome and there are lots of vices, but the main idea is rather simple. The idea is you take your Poincaré algebra, super Poincaré algebra, and you follow the same procedure you followed for our gauge theory. So from the algebra, you introduce the connection, the transformation rules of the connections, the curvatures, and the curvatures are covariant. The difference is that at some point, in order to do gravity and not a gauge theory, you have to impose a torsion constraint. And this is going to change everything. Okay? And you can do this, of course, for n equals 1 supergravity. You can do it for an extended supergravity theory. Of course, in a extended supersymmetry, you start having central charges, so you will have additional objects appearing. You can do it in any dimension. And again, this will give you an idea on how to construct the uh, supersymmetry transformations. You know, I want the building blocks in order to be able to build this supergravity theory. Now, one thing that is very useful in supergravity, and it's important that you know, because depending on which formalism you use now, you will have diff very different actions, even though, of course, the physics should not be uh, dependent on this, uh, has to do with the fact that, indeed, you can, as I did here, impose the torsion constraint right away from the beginning and build your action in terms of the field bind and the gravitino, and the spin connection is nothing but a field that depends on the field bind and the gravitino. But you can also write down a supergravity action in terms of field bind, spin connection, and gravitino, where the spin connection is still an independent field, and the torsion constraint comes out as equations of motion. Okay? Let me just show you very well, I will actually let you do it as an exercise, but let me explain how this works out. So imagine that you write down the Einstein Hilbert action. Now, if I write down the Einstein Hilbert action in terms of differential forms, for instance using the curvature two form that I wrote before. This is my Einstein-Hilbert action. And if you never did it, it's a good exercise to prove that this is indeed just the following action. Okay? You just have to plug in the definition of the differential two form, the curvature two form that I gave you before, uh, transform indices from flat to curve, use properties of the epsilon tensor, and that's what you get. Not too important, but if you never did that, it's a good exercise. Now, this, written in this fashion here, not in this fashion here, because this is the standard, I mean, I, it's like if I write everything using the Levi-Civita connection, but let me write it down as it is here, I define this in terms of the spin connection, and these are instead field binds. Now, as I said, the spin connection becomes a function of the field binds only after I impose the torsion constraint. However, if I don't do that, I treat both of these fields as independent, then I have two equations of motion. Now, I have the equation of motion where I vary my action with respect to the field bind, 
And I have the equation of motion where I vary my action with respect to the spin connection. And you can do this exercise as well. So you can take the variation of the Einstein-Hilbert action with respect to the line and with respect to the spin connection. Of course, if the spin connection is a function of the field bend, then I should really do only this. No? And, I, and, and I should write down the variation of the explicit variation of the action with respect to the field bend, then I have to vary this term with respect to the spin connection and then the spin connection with respect to the field bind. However, if you read them independ as independent fields, I get two different equations because here I should vary only the field binds, whereas here I should vary only the spin connection inside the curvature. Okay? What are the equations of motion I get if I do that? Well, that's interesting because you get the following thing. So, for instance, yeah, uh, well, let me directly state the result, but you can do the exercise. So, the first one gives you the Einstein equations. Of course, multiply with a field bind, but it doesn't matter. So you get the Einstein equation. So this is the standard uh, Riemann. Well, I define, I mean, I don't know if you're used to this notation, but I guess you are. No, this is the standard R mu nu minus. Well, depends now on conventions, but anyway. Okay. And the other one gives you the torsion. Now, again, multiply with some field binds here. I should have probably, uh, yeah, I guess the, 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 the real structure is like this. Uh, rho sigma e rho a e sigma b e mu c equals zero. But anyway, it doesn't matter. I mean, the field binds you can always remove. The point is that you have the torsion vanishing, and here you have the Einstein equation. So the, the, uh, this is interesting, no? Because this is telling you, no, generically, when you vary your action there, you will have the variation of the action with respect to the field bind. And then, in principle, you have the variation of the action with respect to the spin connection. And then if this depends on the field bind, you have to take the variation with respect to the field bind, okay? But you see, the variation with respect to the spin connection is giving you the torsion. So, if you use, you can use what are called first order formalism or second order formalism. So this is my delta omega, essentially, you know? So, if I treat So if I treat the spin connection and the field bind as independent, then I do the so-called first order formalism. If I instead, so this is field bind and omega independent. And then I have the second order formalism, where omega is going to be a function of the field binds and its derivatives, of course. Okay? The interesting thing, though, is that in the first order formalism, the equation of motion that you get from the variation of the spin connection is the torsion vanishing. So effectively, at the end of the day, you get exactly the same theory. And the other interesting thing is that if you instead impose the torsion constraint, so, which means that the torsion has to be vanishing. This tells you that right away this term is zero. So, even if you do it in the second order formalism, this part you don't even need to compute because this is essentially the torsion. Now, why this is interesting? This is interesting because when you go to supersymmetry and supergravity, 
as we said, we want to modify the definition of the torsion. We want now that the spin connection in general be a function of the field bind, but also of the gravitinos. And when you compute supersymmetry invariance, for instance, and so you start and look at the transformation under supersymmetry of the Einstein-Hilbert action, you see you have here how the field bind transforms, and then you have another piece that depends on the transformation of the spin connection. And of course, you can choose the spin connection as it suits you in order to make things work, but the interesting thing is that this comes multiplied by the torsion. And when the torsion vanishes, then that just disappears. So this means that uh, calculations can be much more simple, essentially, because of this relation. And you really have to focus mainly on this part, but we'll come to that later on again. And in the literature, you find both formalisms. Uh, the way it was written down first in 1976 by Ferrara, Friedman, Weinov, and Eisen was in the second order formalism, meaning that they introduced from the beginning a spin connection that was a function also of the gravitinos. So this means that the action contains all sorts of interactions of the gravitinos. So you have the Einstein-Hilbert term, but since in the Einstein-Hilbert term, now imagine already when I write down that thing, when I write the Einstein-Hilbert term, but the curvature contains also the gravitinos because the, no, the spin connection contains the gravitinos, a bilinear. Connection square contains four firm interactions. No, this will appear as the supersymmetric announcement of your Einstein-Hilbert action. So the computations are involved, of course, uh, but you can do that. And that's how Ferrara, Friedman, and Vandenhoisen did it first. And then you have instead the uh, formalism that was uh, uh, the other paper by Deser and Zumino that was published shortly after that used the first order formalism. So in that case, uh, in the Einstein-Hilbert term, you have really only R as a function of omega. There are no gravitinos there. Okay, so the form of simpler in the sense that certain four interactions are not explicit, but they are hidden in the fact that eventually your your spin connection on shell will depend not just on the field, but also on the gravitinos. Okay, so when I write the curvature, I write d omega plus omega omega, but then now when I will be on shell, that will contain also derivatives of the gravitino and bilinears of the gravitinos, quartic terms in the gravitinos. Okay? Questions on this? <laughs> That's so the question is what happens when you try to try and quantize this theory? Because uh, here we're talking about classical theories and we're talking about uh, two formalisms which are equivalent on shell because I'm using the equations of motion. So that's exactly the crucial point, on shell. So as long as you do things on shell, that's fine. When you try to go beyond, so you, you, you do uh, off-shell formulations, and then you try to extend the theory, maybe uh, try to quantize it, or uh, you try and uh, introduce uh, higher order curvatures, for instance. Uh, the results might depend on, uh, on that. It's not obvious that the two formalisms are equivalent. You have to prove it every time. And it's absolutely not obvious. But it, uh, in all the known cases, are equivalent or not? I mean, there are cases in which uh, the, the, the answer is different or? Uh, there are cases in which people don't, didn't prove the equivalence. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's not the same thing as saying that they are different. <laughs> Uh, mainly with higher order curvatures correction. Uh, that's what I can say. I mean, I don't know what else to say. I mean, the thing is that indeed, uh, you are taking two classical theories which are equivalent on shell, 
And therefore, as soon as you try and go off shell or to quantize the theory, then you might get indeed different results in principle. It's not obvious that they are the same. You have to prove it. Other questions? So if we had started um, using this procedure but with no gravity, could we, and, and starting with a superconformal algebra, could we have constructed the West Zumino uh, model, that, that action, using just this as a gauge theory? Well, the West Zumino is just a theory of scalars and fermions, so. Sorry, I just mean like the... the... The idea here is to use the algebra in order to guess what the supersymmetry transformations are for the elements of the algebra. Now, the algebra is the super Poincaré, so you have the, the connections associated to the super Poincaré, which are the field bind, the spin connection, and the gravitino. The, the, the scalar and the fermion are a scalar and a fermion. They are not associated to, to the algebra, no? So... Uh, you can... Uh, so here I, I, I talked about the uh, simple supersymmetry algebra. Of course, you can do the superconformal algebra as well. Uh, of course, you have even more symmetry. So also when you write down the Lagrangian, it will be more constrained. But then you have more symmetry also to be broken. Because just like you want to break uh, translations, imposing the torsion constraint, you will have to impose also additional constraint to uh, break the conformal boosts and also the conformal supersymmetries and dilatations, of course. So you see, uh, you, have, you, you gain a lot using the superconformal approach in the sense that the symmetries are uh, much more constraining in order to write down the Lagrangian. But then you lose a lot in the sense that you have to break more symmetry, you have to introduce more constraints, and then you have to uh, find a way to uh, break these additional symmetries can be done in different ways. You have to find the appropriate compensator fields, uh, the appropriate gauge fixing, and so on and so forth. So every formalism, as I said, has its advantages and its disadvantages. But for sure you can do that using also the superconformal algebra. Anything else? Okay, then let me start just, just introducing at least, and then we'll do tomorrow. I have until, I have 15 minutes more, no? Yeah. Okay. Actually, this maybe I can also do quickly, but there's no need to run. So now we have essentially the ingredients to write down the supergravity action. So how do I write down pure supergravity in four dimensions. So we want clearly the Einstein-Hilbert term. And we want the Rarita Schwinger. Where, of course, now, since I want, I have gravity, and the gravitino is a spinor field, I need the covariant derivative with the spin connection there appearing, because clearly the spinor will transform under local Lorentz transformations. So instead of having just the simple derivative here, like in the ordinary Rarita Schwinger, I have the covariant derivative. And the question is, what else do I need, if I need anything else, to prove 
that the Lagrangian is invariant under which supersymmetric transformations? Under the supersymmetric transformations, which I can guess, as I said before, from the algebra. But actually, and this is also instructive, I could prove that just by asking that the gravitino transforms with the covariant derivative of the supersymmetry parameter, which I know must be the case because I know that gravitino should be the gauge field of supersymmetry, so it must transform with the derivative of the supersymmetry parameter, and since this is coupled to gravity, this must be promoted to a covariant derivative, so this for sure must be there. I can guess it also from the algebra as I explained to you before, but this is for sure always true. Uh, then, so this is, again, the definition that I used before. This is the simple derivative plus, in certain conventions, you have the gamma matrices acting on epsilon. Then I can show you, and we can actually prove that, well, I don't need uh, to fix the supersymmetry transformation of the field bind from the beginning, but I will show you that there is a unique transformation rule here that makes sense, which is the one that you can derive from the algebra, in order to make this invariant under supersymmetry, okay? So, how do I do that? I actually, since I have, I start assuming only the transformation rule of the Gravitino, I start from the transformation of the Rarita Schwinger. Okay? And then I can see that from the transformation rule of the Rarita Schwinger, I will get a term that comes out precisely with Einstein, proportional to Einstein equations. And if I get something that comes out proportional to Einstein equations here, then this clearly should be cancelled by the variation here of the field bind. Now, as I showed you before, the variation of the Einstein-Hilbert action with respect to the field bind gives you the Einstein equations. The variation of the Einstein-Hilbert action with respect to the, to the spin connection gives you the torsion. So, if I can prove that by imposing, imp imp sorry, by using this transformation rule for the gravitino in the rarita schwinger action. I get the Einstein-Hilbert uh, the, 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 the equations of motion, essentially, the Einstein equations, something proportional to the Einstein equations, then this must be cancelled by the variation of the field bind here, and therefore I can guess what the transformation of the field bind is. Okay? So that's the idea. I plug this in here, and I see if I can find something which is proportional to the combination R mu nu, mm, plus, uh, minus, whatever it is, one half g mu nu r. Okay, if I have something that is proportional to that, then that should be cancelled by a variation of the Einstein-Hilbert term. So let me do that. So if we take the variation of the rarita schwinger action, of course I get a number of terms, uh, the Lagrangian. I have... It's a usual, now, usually this thing is also called E. It's the determinant of the field bind, no? So, uh, let me write E over 2. Then I get the derivative of the variation of the gravitino. Then I have the variation of the gravitino here without the derivative. And then... Of course, I have also the variation of the spin connection in there, okay, and the field binds, which I don't write, because for now I just look at the transformation rules and what happens when I apply the transformation rules to the gravitino. <coughs> okay, this term can also be rewritten uh, by putting the derivatives on the other side and delta on this side as, I mean, this is just some field thing, some rearranging actually of the indices. It's not even a field thing, it's really just using the symmetry properties. 
Okay, this can be written in that fashion. I think the modulo signs and coefficients, you can trust me on that. And, and now, you see, when I apply the supersymmetry transformation rule that I have there, here I have a derivative of epsilon, and here I have a derivative of epsilon appearing. Okay? Now, integrating the last term by part, once again, you can rewrite also the last term with uh, two derivatives acting on gravitino and then an epsilon parameter by itself. No, this you can also integrate by parts. So this is going to be something like d mu d mu psi bar rho, gamma mu nu rho, epsilon, plus the boundary terms, OK? Let me now write down the boundary term. It's just an integration by parts. Why, though, I'm doing that? Because, and remember, these are covariant derivatives, no? So that's the important thing, because being covariant, you can move them uh, everywhere without problems, no? Because the, the metric is invariant. Uh, I mean, the covariant derivative of the metric is zero. The field bank also is constant with respect to the covariant derivative, because we asked uh, the, 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 the thing to be torsionless. So the whole thing is, uh, is simple, because of the covariant derivatives appearing. But the important thing here is that now these covariant derivatives can multiply with a, gamma mat a combination of gamma matrices, which is uh, to totally anti-symmetric. So this, again, means that essentially uh, there you have, you can replace this with one half the commutator of the covariant derivatives. Because there is an anti-symmetrization, no? Mu nu rho is, is fully anti-symmetric. So the anti-symmetrization is for free. So writing one half the commutator is exactly writing down uh, one half, two times the same terms, because you can commute uh, the derivatives, no? Modula sign because of the anti-symmetrization. But now, the commutator of covariant derivatives, from what we said before, on a spinor, for instance, is the curvature times gamma matrices acting on the spinor. Okay, this is the usual thing. The covariant derivatives, the commutator of covariant derivatives gives you the uh, curvature. Well, you can see it right away from the expression. No? If you do the the derivative will hit on omega. And then you will have a term which is proportional to omega, omega. d omega plus omega, omega is the curvature. And then everything will come multiply with gamma matrices, of course. So why this is interesting? Because now, you see, this means that the variation of the Rarita Schwinger Lagrangian that I have before contains some gamma matrices times the curvature coming from the first term and the Riemann tensor. And you have an analogous term with the same coefficient, but a different position of the gamma matrices. Plus, of course, all the terms here which I didn't consider, okay? There is a bunch of, uh, there are many other terms here which I didn't consider. But I'm focusing precisely on these ones, okay? So you get exactly these two pieces, and now you have to struggle with some gamma algebra. I'm not going to do, because essentially this is, you see here, you have to use some identity for this, this anti-commutator of gamma matrices. You see, it's the same expression, essentially. Well, modulus of signs that you have to fix. I mean, uh, relabel the indices. But essentially, you need to know what this object is. And this is going to be a single gamma matrix plus 
a bunch of field binds so that, let me skip the computation and, well, if you know what this is, you can do the exercise, you can do it yourself and check what that comes out. But the outcome, and this is the interesting thing, is the following thing. And as I said, and as I promised, here you get the Einstein equations. So clearly, since you know that when you do the variation of the Einstein-Hilbert action with respect to the field bind times the variation of the field bind, what you get is precisely, as I said before, G mu nu uh, E mu A delta E mu A. Okay, as I said, do this exercise. Compute the variation with respect to the field bind, compute the variation with respect to the torsion, and then you will see that you get exactly the equations on the one hand and the torsion equation on the other hand. And this tells you that a way to find supersymmetry invariance, you need this to be proportional to this, clearly. Well, there's going to be some field bind and some factors here, which I forgot now. Okay, this is proportional. Okay, there is. But the important thing is that since you have the same structure here, this, is, this tells you what the supersymmetry transformation should be for the field bind. And in particular, it tells you if you do everything correctly with the appropriate sign. Well, actually, I do have here the sign. So this is actually minus mp squared and then you get also the field bind EA new I already wrote. And so here I have a G new mu. That is it. Okay, so if you do the calculations explicitly, then this is what you get. So this tells you that the transformation rule of the field bind should be 1 over 2 Planck masses epsilon bar gamma a psi mu. Okay? So this is to say that you could derive these directly from the algebra, modulo the fact that you have to introduce also appropriate powers of the Planck mass and the mass parameter that I mentioned in order to have all dimensions correctly because in the algebra you don't see these dimensions, of course. Uh, but you actually just need the supersymmetry transformation of the gravitino in order to prove invariance of the, of the supergravity, because the transformation rule of the field bind comes out directly as a consistency condition in order to cancel the terms that in the Rarita Schwinger come proportional to the curvature, okay? Transformation of the gravitino gives you a covariant derivative of the parameter. This means that since in the action you already have one covariant derivative, you get two covariant derivatives. The commutator gives you a curvature. The curvature gives you the Einstein uh, equations. And then this means that in order to cancel this term from the Rarita Schwinger, you have to have something which is proportional to the Einstein equation on this side, which cancels that. What is that? Well, it's the variation of the Einstein-Hilbert action with respect to the field bind, so this fixes for you the transformation rule of the field bind. Okay? I need the argument of the algebra later. I will need the argument of the algebra later on when we will fix additional things that are not obvious from the supersymmetric transformation. Pure supergravity, then you might not even look at the algebra. You just guess the, the transformation rule of the gravitino, because it must be the gauge uh, vector, the gauge vector, yeah, the gauge transformation, and then the supersymmetric transformation of the uh, of the uh, graviton is fixed, and then 
Are we done yet? No, because as I said, I only computed here the variation with respect to the gravitino, but I have all these dots. So I have additional terms. And also, in the einstein Hilbert action, I did the variation only with respect to the field by not with respect to the spin connection, because that might also introduce additional pieces, depending also on the formalism. However, all the terms are essentially the terms that I'm missing are the variation of the Einstein-Hilbert with respect to the spin connection. This is one term. Another term is the variation of the Rarita-Schwinger with respect to the spin connection, because remember that the spin connection appears in the Rarita-Schwinger action as well, because the covariant derivative contains the spin connection. Then another term is the variation of the Rarita Schwinger with respect to the field bind, because we didn't do that. And then, remember that I was doing variation by parts there. So I will have terms proportional to EA from the integration by parts. Now, you see, if it is proportional to DEA, and I say that the torsion is vanishing, then this might not be important. But now, here, I don't want to commit myself to a certain formalism. So when I do this integration by parts, and I move the derivative, it's not anymore true in general now that DE is vanishing. So I have to take into account not just the term where the derivative hits the gravitino, but also the terms where the derivative is the field bind. I have the determinant of the field bind here. And remember, every time I write down gamma mu, what I'm really writing is E mu A gamma A. These are the constant gamma matrices. And these are instead space-time dependent. Because I have the field bind in order to go from the flat space to the curved space-time. Of course, I need to decide whether I am in the first order formalism. So in the first order formalism, this is something I decide. Or if I am in the second order formalism, which means that I have to take a variation of this in terms of the field bind, and then add the transformation rule of the field bind, which I gave here. Okay. Yeah, I'm already over time. so. Let me just, since we have anyway a lecture tomorrow, so it doesn't pass too much time. The point is that once I put together all these terms, I will show you tomorrow very briefly, you can write down a very simple expression for what remains from the variation of the whole uh, Lagrangian. And you can also see explicitly what are uh, uh, how to fix essentially things in order to make the Lagrangian invariant in the first order or in the second order formalism. Now, uh, that will prove invariance under supersymmetry of that Lagrangian. And the only thing I want to stress is the fact that depending on the formalism, so I don't need to write down, as I will show you, I don't need to write down anything else. This is everything there is. The difference, though, is that in first order formalism, this is everything there is, and omega is an independent field. In the second order formalism, omega contains also gravitino bilinears. So here you have gravitino bilinears, here you have gravitino bilinears and quartic terms, so you have also additional terms in the gravitinos if you write down everything explicitly. Okay? But the action is very simple to write down if you do it the, this way. Okay, so let's stop here for today, and then tomorrow we'll finish this, and then continue move on to coupling also the cosmological constant. I know you're you, you're tired and you want to run, but let me ask first if there are any questions, urgent questions at least. Okay, then thanks. I'll see you tomorrow morning then. <laughs>